welcome to the first online seminar. Now, I will try my best to be as clear as possible. Uh, maybe sometimes I will be like a bit confused, but just stop me and just ask. Uh, I will try my best. So, um, the idea was just to give an overview of the most common NMR methods, uh, the most common use NMR methods for in NMR spectroscopy uh, for doing different things. But before doing this, I want just to give a quick overview on the on the background of the on what uh, uh, we are measuring basically so everything is based uh, on the nuclear spin so it's a uh, quantum mechanical property of the of the um, particles and uh, in our case we are concentrated because it's nuclear magnetic resonance so we are basically concentrated in the nuclear spin uh, so of the of the nucleus and um, Important for this is the so-called spin angular momentum, and uh, it is, as I say, is a quantum mechanical property, and um, it's uh, it's difficult to explain. It just like this, uh, and uh, uh, it's described by a number. And uh, for protons and uh, neutrons in the nucleus uh, is one half. And this uh, we will see later because it's important. And um, so we have this uh, spin angular momentum that uh, is related then to the magnetic momentum. That is basically another, another entity that gives, uh, um, let's say it gives uh, the, how uh, the property um, of the of the nucleus in, then in the in the in the magnetic field, and uh, I know I put this uh, fancy stuff. It's basically just uh, uh, the quantum mechanical uh, way to to describe the energy. So when we in mechanical chemistry, uh, mechanical chemistry we want to describe an or in quantum mechanics. Uh, in general, we want to describe uh, uh, the energy of an interaction. We, we use uh, this uh, this symbol that is called a Hamiltonian, and um, it basically tells you on uh, what uh, the the energy on what is dependent the energy uh, that um, uh, for the interaction of uh, in, let's say in this case. Uh, in our case is the, our our atoms with the magnetic field. So in our case, the interaction energy is given by this ma magnetic moment that is uh, basically uh, related to the angular momentum. So the, the the one that we described before, and this constant that is basically the it's called the geomagnetic ratio, and uh, is basically uh, proper of uh, different uh, elements and uh, it's proper of uh, different elements and so it's uh, different if we have the like let's say hydrogen or carbon or nitrogen so uh, it's really important to then have difference between uh, uh, the different elements when we go uh, and measure measure the NMR experiment and then uh, the energy of the interaction depends also on uh, a magnetic field that we are going to apply for then measure the um, our experiments. So this is a quick uh, little table on different atoms that are uh, NMR uh, active. So basically, you see this is the number of the spin angular momentum, and uh, basically to have uh, a nuclear that can uh, we can measure at the NMR, this number has to be different than zero. And uh, in our case, we have the proton that is one half. And then the, for in the protein, the most common atoms are carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And we, here we see that uh, uh, for in our case, uh, then the normal, so the natural uh, carbon and uh, nitrogen, then the carbon 
is not uh, is not active, so we cannot use it. In the case of the nitrogen, we have a different uh, uh, spin number, and uh, because this is not one half, uh, we cannot use it because there are other problems with uh, nuclei that uh, has like a different number than one half of the spin number. So basically what we can use for our purposes is the proton and two isotopes of the, of the carbon and the nitrogen that are carbon 13 and nitrogen 15 that has a spin number, um, spin one, two number, one half. And then the other, um, the other important thing is to, to check here the geromagnetic ratio. As I said, it's proper of uh, the different uh, elements and it changes also if we have different isotopes. And basically it, it gives you uh, how strong is the signal that then you can uh, acquire when you uh, do NMR. And you can see that the, basically the proton is the, is the bigger one and the, the carbon and nitrogen have smaller ones. So basically, uh, the signal, if we detect directly the signal of these two atoms, um, the signal of the, uh, uh, the intensity of the signal is lower in the same condition compared to the, the, the proton. So this is, is the three atoms that uh, uh, we, are common, uh, we commonly use uh, for the NMR. So as I say, usually we have our, our atoms that uh, with their uh, uh, magnetic moment and uh, in a normal situation without a magnetic field the, the magnetic moment will be oriented randomly in the space so nothing is happening basically so we want to make uh, this atom interacting and make it this atom doing something to, so then we can collect something and the first is we apply the, the magnetic field. And uh, when we apply an external magnetic field, what happens is this basically the magnetic moment uh, align with the, magne uh, the magnetic field we applied. And they can, uh, um, uh, they, can, they can align in the same direction in the opposite direction of the magnetic field. Obviously, one of the two is, let's say, uh, more uh, uh, at less energy, so more stable than uh, the other one. And um, so when we apply the, the magnetic field, we have this situation that if we look uh, at a more um, quantum mechanic uh, point of view, what is happening is basically um, we can say that uh, we are splitting the our atoms so before to apply the magnetic field we have this situation and this situation for all the atoms there is a, only one state possible so there is only one situation from the, with the, uh, that uh, or let's say all the all this the different situation have the same energy once we apply the magnetic field what's happening is basically that uh, the, the states, so the, the possible uh, configuration of the atoms uh, that before what has uh, the same energy have no more the same energy. And so we have a splitting and what's happening is basically that uh, our, our spins align with the, with the magnetic field occupying the two different uh, states, so the two possible configuration. And there is, there is one that is uh, more populated than the other. And uh, you see here the difference, the different color for the, uh, of the different lines is basically the different elements. In this case, this is the nitrogen, the, the red is the carbon and the um, blue is the hydrogen. And uh, it's basically uh, the different energy due to the different zero magnetic ratio of the atoms. So, we have different intensity of the signal at the end because the different energy that separate these uh, levels is different. But, uh, and this is a more or less a quantum mechanical point of view, but uh, a useful uh, things uh, and uh, point of view to look at the NMR experiment is the vectorial model. 
So basically, if we look at, at, at uh, this situation, uh, what we, we, we will have that the, all the magnetic moment are aligned in the same direction, more or less. And um, what uh, all together, they will form uh, a vector, so um, macroscopic magnetization. And this uh, is uh, these vectors is the magnetization, and basically are the effect of the all uh, magnetic moment uh, aligned to the to the magnetic field. In this situation, so we are in this situation, and uh, so we created this man magnetization applying this uh, magnetic field. Or if we look at the other side, we create this. Uh, uh, splitting, uh, applying the, the magnetic field. But if we leave it as it is, nothing, we cannot detect anything. Because basically to detect something, you have to perturb uh, the, the, the system. And so if we look at this, we have to basically uh, uh, make the part of this, uh, move this uh, particle out of the equilibrium. And so uh, after doing the relaxation, we can collect the, the our NMR spectra. And looking at the Victoria model, what we are do what we do for doing this is basically we apply a second uh, magnetic field, much weaker, and uh, exactly perpendicular to the magnetization. The effect of this is uh, create a, a procession of our magnetization. So it's a physical phenomenon. And uh, basically our magnetization start to proceed and going in the XY plane. Once we have this uh, XY, um, uh, our magnetization, the XY plane, what is happening is that because we have always also uh, uh, another magnetic field apply much much uh, bigger than this one but so we have always this uh, aligned with the z z axis let's say what uh, is happening that uh, for the same reason when uh, we apply the b1 the magnetization start to proceed here in this case uh, our magnetization in the x y plane because there is the uh, b0 aligned to the z axis it start to proceed and uh, so it start to oscillating and um, the the frequency of the oscillation in the xy is, uh, plane is um, equal to the zero magnetic new ratio so is um, is different if we have different uh, elements and on the 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 um, magnetic field that the 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 atom, uh, let's say, um, uh, sense. And uh, this magnetic field is slightly different than the B0 that we apply. This is because uh, um, the, the environment uh, that there is uh, um, around the, our, our atoms. So basically, the environment give a rise to this uh, constant that is the shield constant and uh, that, up, that uh, make a correction on the B0 that we apply giving uh, an effective field that is slightly different than the, the one of, uh, we apply. And this one is important because uh, it's responsible for uh, the different uh, um, of the chemical shift later in the, in the different uh, environments. So when uh, um, our protein, for example, is change environment. We have also uh, is, uh, this factor that is contributing to make uh, uh, our chemical shift changing. And uh, this uh, uh, oscillation is what we can collect and uh, is what we collect to then uh, have our NMR uh, spectra. And this frequency is called Larmor frequency. And so we collect this oscillation and we make uh, like this Fourier transform that is a, ma a mathematic uh, process and uh, transformation, sorry. And uh, 
at the end we have our one in this case 1D spectrum where uh, our axis uh, is uh, in frequencies also if is not exactly in the dimension of the frequencies the the uh, nmr spectra is reported in um, in chemical shift units uh, that is basically part per million part per million and uh, basically is uh, our uh, is defined as uh, our uh, frequency so our let's say um, the frequency of uh, the oscillation of our our atom minus uh, the um, the frequency of a reference that we have to set up like the zero divided all by the the same uh, frequency and so basically what we have is uh, a difference in the frequency with respect to a zero uh, in part per million in part per million and basically this is the chemical shift and this is uh, how we report the the, the um, nmr spectra and uh, depending on the chemical shift we will find a different uh, type of atoms so for example this is a 1d of the proton and um, we will have uh, that, uh, here the, the the protons attached to the aliphatics uh, carbon and uh, in this region here the the proton attached to the nitrogen or the aromatics and so we can see that you start to, uh, depending on this, in the environment of the of the of our atoms, it changed the, the chemical shift. Uh, but so this is the one D NMR spectra. The problem is that, as you can see, there are a lot of peaks, and we cannot say which one is which because they are many are overlapped. For example, here in reality, there are like. Uh, or 100 uh, different peaks down here. And so we want to resolve this overlapping. And that's why we start with the multidimensional NMR. Basically, the, the concept behind the multidimensional NMR is just to uh, add um, another time dimension in our experiment. This is done uh, um, in the pulse sequences. So when you prepare and uh, you just uh, uh, work with your magnetization, so you just uh, uh, moving your magnetization as you want. Um, you can do many things depending on what you want to do, and uh, you can add a in, we call it indirect dimension time, because basically we are not uh, like in the detect in the detection that we uh, collect uh, respect to the time but we create a, a third dimension, so basically a uh, second dimension, so basically we are just adding another time dimension. So respect the 2D, we will have uh, uh, two, the, two evolution times, let's say, and so when we uh, look at the spectra, we will have a, a 2D spectra that uh, if you consider the intensity of the peaks uh, are in the third dimension and uh, we can go on and do like the third uh, 3d nmr spectra so basically we are adding another um, evolution period and what we will have uh, is a 3d spectra with let's say the intensity of the peak in the, in the fourth dimension and here we can choose what we want to to look at and uh, so this is the the basic concept uh, to then build up uh, our different nmr exper uh, experiments and uh, to build up these different experiments uh, we can use different observables that are uh, that are present in the in our proteins and our molecules so there is the the j coupling that is uh, a constant that um, um, have an effect on the NMR spectra and is basically due to the, uh, the bond between different atoms. So this is useful if you want to, to um, uh, let's say, check different properties and, uh, and 
and use uh, uh, um, and look at, for example, at atoms that are uh, one next to each other because there are bonds through each other. And uh, an example are the HSQC, but also li li like uh, common experiment that use this J coupling is the um, uh, triple resonance of so the 3D or 4D um, experiments for the assignment where you can just decide, uh, uh, let's say, through which bonds you want to go to then uh, uh, build your, your experiment. And then uh, there is the NOE effect. So it's basically uh, an effect that can, uh, we call it transfer demagnetization. Basically what uh, this, uh, this uh, effect allows you to do is to look uh, through the space. So you can look at one atom and uh, check which, which other atoms are next to this one. And um, on the other side, you can also look at the property of the relaxation. So how your, your molecule relax and uh, depending on the different uh, constants uh, that describe uh, our relaxation, we can uh, um, monitor, for example, the dynamics of our protein. And so it's useful also for, uh, to check uh, if there are changing in the conformation or, or in the dynamics of our, our protein. And uh, some, uh, some experiments that uh, work with different observable are like these ones. So uh, this is the chemical ship perturbation. So basically you just evaluate uh, uh, the, the different in the chemical shifts to try to understand certain things or NOE and PRE that are basically looking at which atoms are next to others and I will describe later a bit and other experiment that basically depending on what you what in which information you want to to have you can try to collect with different experiments. So for example, uh, this experiment is useful for um, give uh, the orientation of the different uh, uh, atoms uh, in, uh, for example, in, uh, in a domain. So I will start uh, describing maybe the most important uh, experiment or the most common one is the HSQC. Basically it's a 2D spectra where we use the J coupling between the N, so the nitrogen and the proton to, to have a 2D spectra. So in one dimension, we have uh, uh, the chemical shift of uh, our proton. And in the other one, we have the chemical shift of the nitrogen. And uh, the peaks are this circle here. And basically for every, every peaks that we look here is, uh, one NH group in our protein. So because the, the NH group in the protein are not so common, they are basically one per each uh, amino acid in the, in the backbone of the protein, plus the NH that are in the side chain. So for example, here, there are a few amino acids that have uh, um, uh, an NH group in the side chains. And uh, so, because you are looking basically at the NH of the backbone, so more or less uh, we have one peak for every amino acid, we can try with this experiment to monitor the, um, the, the situation of our protein. And uh, this is why I are useful because they are more, let's say, quick to, to collect, pretty easy to collect. To, uh, let's say also uh, quite sensitive and so they are good for monitoring your protein and to check if uh, upon changing some condition your protein uh, is affected from these different conditions. So an example here is uh, the, to use the HSQC is the chemical shift perturbation and this is useful for example to check if uh, um, 
uh, two molecules, uh, uh, two proteins or proteins RNA or also protein and small ligand are interacting because what you expect if the two molecules are, uh, are interacting, uh, this will change somehow uh, the conformation of your protein or the environment of some uh, atoms in your protein. And because it's changing maybe uh, the, the environments, you can uh, see it in the, in the, in the spectra. And for example, here are uh, the, the um, we are looking at basically the chemical ship perturbation of, uh, of certain amino acids. So I forgot to mention that usually when we have this spectra, we have also the assignment. So we know for each, uh, uh, for each peak, which amino acid is responsible for this peak. So for example, we know that this is glycine number uh, 81, this is arginine uh, and so on. And uh, if we have also this structure and knowing which uh, uh, amino acid is responsible, uh, is responsible for this peak, we can plot the, 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 the uh, peaks that are changing on the structure of our protein. And uh, this allows you to give uh, an idea, to have an idea on uh, the, the surface that uh, um, uh, is affected by the, the changing of the environment. So for example, if we uh, are adding RNA and uh, we see these di this different shifts and they are all more or less uh, situated in the same, located in the same region, we can uh, um, think that probably the RNA is binding in that region. And uh, you can also uh, represent these shifts in, uh, in grass. And basically what you do, what you are doing here is taking the, the different frequencies of these, uh, these peaks. So there is uh, the nitrogen frequencies and the proton frequencies. And uh, you, using this, you can calculate the chemical ship perturbation that is basically a number and put uh, in the graph here. And this uh, it gives you also another point of view to look at uh, which are the regions that uh, has a higher chemical shift. So where the peaks are moving uh, more than the others. And so basically, which are the regions that probably are responsible for the binding or for the interaction, or if we change the soil condition, which are the um, uh, regions that are affected by the uh, changing of the soil concentration. Be, you have always to be careful on, with this experiment that uh, usually you are looking at the backbone, so at the NH of the backbone. And for, so for example, that could be that sometimes you have interaction between the side chain of, uh, of your protein. And uh, if it's not changing enough that all the environment uh, also in the backbone, you, you can maybe not see this uh, interaction. But uh, usually it's a good method to check overall the regions that uh, are, are binding or are affected by our uh, changing our condition. And uh, so this is why it's useful and it's also quite, uh, uh, quite uh, easy to collect this kind of data. On the others and uh, another thing, yeah, so as I say, this uh, is thanks to the, the J coupling. So you can collect this type of spectra because during your pulse sequence, uh, you are selecting, thanks to the J-coupling, you're selecting only this group here. Obviously, in the, in the, in, if we can, we can collect also like the 3D spectra, and in, this, in that case, we can, for example, decide that uh, we, can, we want to see the HN, but also the C-alpha, for example, here. And 
thanks to the J-conflict that has a certain value, we can select, uh, for example, to see also this C alpha. So uh, this type of experiment is why it's useful for then the assignment because you can try to uh, follow the, the, the atoms in the chain and then uh, put it together like, and it's like putting together like a puzzle and, uh, and uh, have the, completely, the complete assignment of our protein. On the, others, on the other hand, we have uh, the, the nosy spectra that is based on the NOE. And as I said before, NOE is uh, an effect that uh, uh, allows you to see uh, through the space. For example, this uh, is a nosy spectra. It's, so it's a 2D spectra where we have in both dimensions the protons. And uh, we are basically seeing here uh, which uh, atoms is next to the other. So for example, if we have like the method here, so this proton here, which other protons are next to this one? And this information is given by these peaks here. So when we see these peaks here, we say that there is a correlation between the different, uh, for example, these uh, uh, protons here and this one. And uh, this allows you to say that uh, are more or less next to each other. And uh, this is, for example, of uh, the nosy spectra of uh, of this uh, molecule that is uh, the codeine. And uh, these are useful for many reasons because, for example, you can uh, uh, try to understand, as I say, which, uh, considering one atom, which other atoms are next to the one you are observing. So it's useful, for example, uh, if you want to, also in this case, if you want to check a lingon where is binding on the on the on your protein or the RNA with the protein uh, because you can check for example which protons of the RNA is interacting with which protons of the of the protein and so it's useful for this but it's also useful uh, usually in the structure calculation of the with the NMR because uh, you can build um, a network of restraints so knowing that uh, this atom is next to certain atoms and then other are next to the others, we can build this network that uh, um, helps you to calculate then the, the, the structure of your protein. So the nosy, the, the nosy spectra and more in general, all the uh, NMR spectra based on the NOE is they are really important because uh, um, you can uh, check the, the the distances in the space, uh, and so not uh, because just because they are uh, bounded together of different atoms. And uh, on so we we look at uh, the different uh, atoms that are bound to each other next to space, and uh, another things that we can look at is the relaxation property of, uh, of our proteins. And what we are looking basically in the relaxation is uh, how uh, the, our protein, once you, you just um, hit the protein with, the, with our pulses, how it just go back, it just go back to, the, to the equilibrium state. And, uh, Usually in the relaxation experiment, what you're, what you're doing is uh, um, see how um, the, the, the protein relax, uh, monitoring basically, uh, checking the different the intensities of the peaks uh, in, in, in time, basically. So if we look at the, the NMR signal uh, in certain, um, one after, uh, so basically we put a delay, uh, but I think it is not so much important. So basically we can uh, see how the, the protein relax and there are different constants uh, describing uh, the, 
the relaxation. There is uh, R1 and R2. And there are the two, uh, the two important uh, relaxation rate for, for uh, in, in the NMR. And for example, in this case, we are measuring these rates and comparing these different, uh, uh, for example, uh, different, uh, the protein in different contexts, we can try to understand in, uh, in which one the, our protein is uh, uh, more dynamic or more static. So for example, uh, this difference it tells you that uh, um, if, the, uh, if the, the protein is, uh, it can uh, move faster or slower, and so if it's more dynamic, and so for example, if uh, it's structure or not. And uh, or you can also check a, a different region in the same protein. So there are uh, proteins that um, part of the protein that are um, more structured, so are less dynamics, and others that are more dynamics. And so you can try to understand also what's happening in your protein, the different properties of different parts of the protein. This is another way to look at more or less at the same thing is uh, based on the, again, on the NOE effect. But uh, in this case, we use it to check uh, the dynamics uh, of the backbone of the protein because uh, we are looking at the HN group. And also here, basically, we, uh, we look at the intensity of the, our signal. And uh, if the, 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 the protein, um, let's say they do, our domains is, uh, is structured, so are, are fixed, and so they are not allowed to move a lot. And uh, so the intensity in comparing uh, of, the, of, the, of the peaks are more or less the same if we apply or not uh, the NOE effect. And uh, comparing through the whole sequence, what we, we can check, we can check, for example, in some regions, they are, are decreasing in the intensity of the, of the protein, in the intensity of the peaks of the protein. And this, this tells you basically that this part is uh, less, uh, let's say, is more, uh, more dynamic. So it can, uh, uh, let's say, tumble and uh, go around freely more than the, the, other, the other part of the protein. And this is useful, for example, because if we, we have a, a rearrangements of the, of the protein, or again, if we uh, have a, a part of the protein that before is uh, unstructured and so dynamic, and then upon the binding of the ligand of the RNA, it becomes structure. In this case, we will uh, expect that uh, uh, when it's a structure and dynamic, the, the, the intensity are lower. Then when it becomes structured, they will be, uh, the intensity will be uh, higher. And so it's also here um, a way to monitor which are the regions um, that uh, um, in solution are responsible for different interaction and how they behave, so the dynamics. And, uh, more or less the same concept here. So this is a, the a different type of experiment is the paramagnetic relaxation enhancement. And uh, also here, you're basically checking uh, different uh, distances between uh, a certain atom and the others. In this case, what we are doing is uh, to introduce uh, a label that usually is a paramagnetic center. And this uh, has an effect on the relaxation of the atoms that are next to this label. Um, let's say till, usually it's till 20 angstrom. So the effect is that without uh, the, this label, we will have our, our spectra. And uh, when we intro introduce a label here, we will see that uh, the, the atoms that are next 
to this label are affected. So the, um, the relax in this case, uh, they 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 will relax much uh, uh, faster, and uh, the result is basically that you are losing the intensities and uh, the the peaks uh, uh, are broadening. Let's say, and uh, what you do then is just take the intensities of these peaks and plot it in. Uh, in the in graphs and uh, this the start indicates where you can put uh, the, where uh, the, the the paramagnetic label is uh, is placed and you can see that where there is uh, the uh, paramagnetic label is always a, a reduction of the intensity of the of the peaks but then we have uh, um, uh, loss in the intensity of the of the peaks also in other in other regions that are different depending on the on the on the placement of the of our label so basically we can try to understand which region are next to the others looking at this different intensity in the in the in the nmr so for example probably this part of the region is next to this one so it's probably interacting with this part of the region and again this one is next to this one and so on so is useful for um, for example uh, again if uh, it's useful if you want to check uh, interaction that are weak and transient because this biomagnetic label if you label one of the two um, molecules that you want to to study you can check uh, this uh, this interaction even if they are weak and uh, and transient because is uh, gives you this effect and uh, um, is good uh, to um, you can detect these differences also if this interaction are weak and transient uh, another type of experiment also uh, this one is a more let's say is bit more tricky so what you're doing is to put your your let's say protein in uh, a medium that is not anisotropic is uh, an anisotropic uh, um, medium so basically in this case the the medium so the solution that you put inside uh, your in, uh, your protein uh, makes your protein to prefer certain orientation than others and uh, so your protein is not free cannot um, rotate freely there are some uh, orientation that are prefer respect to the others and uh, this effect uh, can it can be detected from the the like HSQC spectra, these are more or less HSQC spectra, where uh, you can detect the, the J coupling. So usually this is the J coupling between two atoms, and you go to measure the difference between the your your sample in a normal media. So when it's free to uh, reorient uh, is free to reorient in uh, in uh, in which way it wants, and uh, when it is an anisotropic uh, media where it can only so where uh, some uh, some orientation are preferred, and there is a, a difference in this J coupling, and this difference is uh, due to this. Uh, um, this factor that is called the uh, residual dipolar coupling and what you uh, what you go to to check is this different and uh, basically after some uh, calculation because at the, at the end is uh, uh, you try uh, to retro calculate uh, um, how the, the different orientation how they fit uh, with your data and you at the end, you came out with uh, uh, certain the orientation that are uh, preferred, and 
uh, it allows you to to understand uh, the orientation of the different atoms and uh, then also of the different domains in the protein and uh, it, this is useful for example if you want to calculate the structure or the conformation of a protein with different domains because it allows you to try to understand the different orientation of the of the protein or or the different for example secondary structure elements so it's useful for uh, try to understand the orientation of the different uh, atoms in the protein. Uh, so with this, I, I finish a, a quick overview on different uh, uh, NMR spectra that, uh, I, so this, this uh, we check it for example, uh, we saw different NMR spectra that are uh, used for um, usually to uh, study our proteins, so with, for the dynamics of a protein, the interaction, uh, the structure calculation, and so on. When uh, we want to study, in uh, more in particular, uh, the interaction between uh, a protein with a small molecule, so a ligand, we can also have. Uh, um, Besides the, the some of the experiment uh, I I already described, we can use a slightly different uh, experiment that uh, are also useful. For example, during uh, um, drug discovery, because uh, some of these experiments are, uh, let's say, high throughput. It's not really really high throughput, but allows you to screen a lot of different. Uh, ligands. So there are two approaches. You can uh, go with the ligand detection. So you detect, you, you go and detect the, the, the signal of the ligands, or you can go with the protein detection. So you go and uh, try to detect only the, the, the signal of the protein. Obviously, the most uh, advantage in the ligand detection is uh, that you don't have the limitation on the size of the protein because uh, uh, NMR has a limitation as you go with uh, uh, big proteins. On the other hand, um, uh, with the protein detection, we have uh, uh, we can detect more um, more in detail the interaction of our ligand because we can detect uh, the, the residues of our protein. So we have uh, residues le levels uh, information. So it's more useful if you want to then study in, um, in detail the, the interaction. And uh, I will describe quickly these few experiments. So one is the water loxy. So is called because uh, it's based on the excita uh, excitation of the of the of the water. Basically, you just collect uh, two different uh, spectra. Um, I forgot uh, that more or less all these experiments here are one D spectra, and that's why it's also um, um, suitable for uh, let's say high throughput screening. So. In this case, we have two different uh, samples, one with only the ligand and one with the ligand and the protein. And what we are doing is basically, uh, we are uh, uh, we, we excite the, the, the water molecules. And because there are uh, the NOE effects, so you just work with the NOE effect, basically what's is uh, you 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 see is that um, exciting this uh, this water molecule. This water molecule just then can uh, transfer the magnetization to other water molecule till your protein and your uh, your ligand. And so, what you are doing is basically. Um, collected two different uh, 
spectra and because uh, uh, the ligand when it's free is a small molecule but when it's bounded to the um, to the to our protein it behaves like a, a big a big uh, a big protein so there is a difference we can detect this difference because the effect um, on this phenomena is uh, is dependent on the on the um, let's say at the end with the molecular weight of uh, our our particles so in the case of a small ligand is uh, because it's small we will have a, a positive um, positive uh, peaks like here but uh, if the ligand is interacting with our protein what's happening is basically it behaves like uh, is a big protein and uh, in this case uh, the signal are are uh, negatives and so just seeing the 1d spectra and then seeing if this if the sign of the signal you can understand if our our ligand is binding or not and so it's useful to to check if our ligand is is binding or not Similar is uh, the another experiment that is saturation transfer difference. It works more or less the same. In this case, you you also here you collect two different spectra, and uh, with these two different spectra, uh, you subtract one to the other, and in one spectra you you just uh, collect a normal spectra. And then you collect uh, a spectra exciting only the protein. And uh, the final result is basically that if you subtract uh, one spectra to the other, is uh, uh, the final the, the, the result spectra is a spectra that is carrying only the, the, only the um, signal of the, of the ligand that is binding our protein. So when we apply this, we can uh, check if there are signal. This is, that means that uh, uh, our ligand is interacting with our our uh, protein. And so also this is uh, this is particular in particular is a really common experiment for like uh, screening of small uh, molecule. Uh, if they are binding with protein, if you want to use uh, NMR. And um, also here is another way. This uh, is rely on the relaxation properties. So again, because uh, uh, when is uh, free, the ligand is a small molecule, but when it's bounded, it behaves like a, a, pro a big protein. You can detect this with uh, the relaxation properties. And so you can you collect different spectra, so the 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 ligand alone, and if you collect the ligand alone, you will have the the signal of the ligand. But if it binds to the to the um, protein, then it behaves like a big protein, so has a, has different uh, relaxation properties, and uh, the result is basically you don't see any more. The, the, the signal of your ligand. And this is another way to detect the, 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 the binding of a protein and a small, a small molecule. Uh, so these are the most common, uh, I think the most common um, experiments, especially from the ligand uh, detection part. On the other side, we have uh, uh, experiments that uh, that you can check also the pro your protein, and um, these experiments are also useful because they go much more in detail on the binding of uh, if there are if there is binding, but especially the the mode of binding of uh, our molecule. So these are based on the noses. So Again, the same concept that uh, you can see which atom are next to each other. And uh, in this case, we call it the filter nosy because 
what we have, we have, uh, let's say, our sample where we have our protein that is labeled and our ligand that is uh, our normal ligand, so with normal uh, isotope, natural uh, isotope uh, carbon 12 and nitrogen 14. And uh, because there is this difference in the, in the labeling of the, of the two, you can decide if you want to detect only the ligand signal or only the protein signal. And this is called filtering or editing. And uh, you can also choose to do both at the same time. So for example, if you do both at the same time, what you detect is basically only the, um, the intramolecular interaction between the protein and the uh, ligand. So for example, you will see only the, the, the signal due to the, the atoms of the ligand that can see the atoms of our protein. On the other side, we can also have like the, only the filter nosy. In this case, we will have uh, the um, our our intramolecular NOE, but in this case, uh, we will have uh, in one dimension also the 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 signal of our protein. So in this case, it's useful because you can detect the intramolecular NOE, but also uh, some other signal of the of your protein. So it's useful also to investigate more the binding mode of your protein, of your, of your molecule. And uh, with this, I, I think I, I finish my, my presentation. So just to reassume, so we saw different NMR methods that basically more or less all these methods just uh, um, use different observables uh, that could be the chemical shifts. So for example, monitoring the chemical shifts, you can assign, but uh, try to predict the secondary structure. And uh, as we saw in the HSQC spectra, try to detect the changing in the protein conditions and which are the regions that are um, uh, changing in our protein. On the other side, the decoupling, so the, the, the coupling of, of atoms that are bounded together, we can use uh, for different experiments to, uh, to build our experiment for our different purposes. But uh, the direct, direct the detention of this decoupling allows you to calculate the dihedral angle. So basically, uh, the secondary structure of our protein. So it's another way to try to uh, predict the secondary structure of the protein. Then we saw the NOE effect that uh, is uh, really useful because it can see through space. So you can monitor um, which atoms are next to each other in the space and not uh, in the sequence because, uh, for example, they are um, bounded together. So only the atoms that are uh, next to the, each other in the space, uh, even if they are not bounded. And uh, the most common NOE, the NOSI spectra, it allows you to go till more or less five angstrom. Then we saw that there is, for example, the PRE that allows you to go more uh, far, but in that case is slightly different. But anyway, the principle is, more or less the same because you're always looking uh, through space of uh, other atoms that are next to each other. Then we saw the RDCs that are useful for um, understand more on the orientation of the different bonds or the angles of the different bonds and then domain orientation and the relaxation that uh, you can directly detect the mobility and dynamics of uh, of our objects, but uh, also then we saw it can be used for then in other experiments, for example, for detect the binding of a small molecule, uh, relying on the different uh, relaxation properties of the different molecules. Hoping that was not too much uh, confusion in this. Uh, I thank you and if you have questions, 
or if I I finish for today.